We've been financially independent for seven years now. Um, but we we're kind of approaching our finances much differently and that we're trying to like spend or give away the maximum amount versus the minimum amount. Um, and it's been kind of a, a good shift in, uh, in good for us just in the season of life. Um, realizing that I don't want like an obscene amount of money when I'm old. Um, I just want more time and like more fun and more adventures with my kids now. And was it just like a realization or was it like looking at the books and being like, this money just keeps growing. And so we definitely can spend more. Like what was it that made you feel comfortable enough to, to change mm -hmm. that bottom line? Cause that's a yeah. scary thing. Cause it's one of those where you feel like once you make that change, you're probably making that change forever, even though it's yeah. not true. But it, I think a lot of times people think like, if I start increasing it now, I'm kind of setting myself up yeah. for a habit. Well, so I, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people who are looking at transitioning. So I'm kind of in people's numbers and I'm in like this season of life with people a lot. Um, and one of the things that um, I do with clients and I, shifted my finances in the same direction was I have, I call it like the old age pot of money, um, mostly in retirement accounts. But the idea is, you know, your money with compound interest should double about every 10 years. So once you get to right around that, like 300, 600,000, if you're still fairly young, you're probably done saving for your old age money. Cause it's gonna, it's, it has a couple chances to double. So when you're 65, it'll be plenty. And that's based on like this 4% rule of withdrawal. But I have this in between pot too, and it has different rules. And the old age money, the goal of that is for it to never run out. This in between pot of money, the goal is to actually use all of it. Because once you get to old age money, like that's going to pay the bills. And so in this in-between pot, um, you know, you can pull, we're planning on pulling about 10% from that. And that really allows you to kind of increase your spending because the goal isn't to sustain this amount of money indefinitely. It's to use it within 10, if you pull 10%, it'll get you about 13 years on average, uh, maybe 15. Um and so kind of maximizing your spending and, and just reorganizing your finances a little bit um, to give people more cash flow in in this season of life when honestly their expenses are probably the highest they ever will be. How do you define enough for yourself <laughs> and how do you know when to shut it off? So just for some context, I was actually listening today to Ramit's podcast, the I Will Teach You To Be Rich mm -hmm. podcast, and there was this guy on there making $2.5 million a year, yeah. spending 20 grand, and him and his wife were like about to go through a divorce because he just couldn't shut off the bringing in money wheel. He was obsessed mm -hmm. with making money, didn't know how to spend on himself for a better quality of yeah. life. So I'm kind of curious how you balance those two things. Like, how do you, you know, not go and upgrade your lifestyle to the max mm -hmm. so that you're no longer financially independent? Yeah but you're keeping it at a level where you're not feeling like you're depriving yourself. Cause I feel like finding that enough is really difficult for most people. Yeah. Um, so with, uh, in, in that person's kind of case study, um, if they were, if they were one of my clients, we would definitely kind of go back to their childhood and their family of origin because I've, I've talked to hundreds of people about their money. I've like, I've been in so many people's finances. Um, I've never met a single person that how they managed their money, how they felt about their money, how they thought about their money didn't make perfect sense. Even if how they did it, I wildly disagreed with, um, or I thought was like, kind of bizarre or, you know, in that case, like just a huge disconnect. Um, once you understand their personality and once you understand that those early childhood experiences and that family of origin and that culture of origin, it all adds up. Um, and, and sometimes, especially like in the five space, 
Um, it kind of rewards people who have a little bit of the scarcity mindset and who have this fear around money. Uh, they tend to be pretty good at saving and budgeting and reducing expenses. But I always tell people like that might have served you really well. And it might have gotten you out of debt and it might have gotten you this huge nest egg. But what got you here won't take you where you want to go next. And if you want this next chapter to really be enjoying your your family and your time and your freedom, like that same mindset, those same kind of values might not serve you in this next chapter. And you kind of have to unwind um, some of that. And it is tough. It is tough when like it worked for your grandparents and it worked for uh, your parents and it worked for you. Like I have a lot of high earning clients um, and a really common kind of money mindset that they usually grew up around was you can work your way out of money stress and out of money problems. If you have a money problem in your life, you just work harder. You work longer hours like uh, you get more education, you get a better paying job. And that, that works for a certain, for a certain amount of time. But then like you're a workaholic and you have no life and you've bankrupted all these other elements of your life. Um, and it's not like you might actually have to start budgeting and, uh, investing and doing things a little different. And when you're working with all these people, couples, and you're kind of unpacking mm -hmm. that past. Obviously, I think a lot of times, you know, if you, you hear the example like Cody could just gave, there's probably, you know, some interest in changing that person, getting them to come to a little bit more sustainable lifestyle. When you're trying to get someone to change, have you found that most of the time it's just helping them understand where it came from so they can accept it and realize it? Or I guess, what do you see as a way that helps people actually do something about it? Yeah. So there's a, a common theme in psychology that our default um, is when we see the patterns in our family of origin, the default is to either copy or rebel against one or the other. Uh, just instinctively, we pick one or the other. Um, and sometimes that works out great. Sometimes to copy or to rebel against is the exact right thing you should be doing. But oftentimes, um, to get us where we want to go, there's a more unique path. There's a more customized path. There's a slight shift into this default or into this like copy or reject. And so realizing what the patterns were, which patterns they either copied, which patterns they rejected, and what patterns are actually going to take you where you want to go. Um, and we might, some of those we can maybe keep, some of them maybe are working well, but a lot of them we have to we have to adjust a little bit. We have to tweak a little bit because they're not going to serve you to make progress in your goals. Shifting gears a little bit to content creation, I'm actually going to give you a challenging question to see if you can think back way back because you've been <laughs> just creating online for a while now, helping, inspiring. Can you remember back to the first piece of content that you ever published or shared or anything online and then how you felt and how you got the courage to actually go and create that piece of content. And this, this question might sound weird, but it's going to make sense as we meander into the next topic. <laughs> um, I, I kind of, I kind of do. Um, I, it was a little set of blog posts. I created like five or six. Um, one of them was about, and this was way back. Oh my goodness. This was seven years ago. Um, so seven years ago, one of them that I really liked, it was only a couple paragraphs, but it was called work optional. And it was kind of the term that me and my husband used when we transitioned into our FI life. Um, and I shared it, uh, with Jay Money, another personal finance blogger. He was running a curation site at the time and I emailed him and I said, Hey, I'm like, I'm going to launch a blog. I have, I have these posts, like, do you have any feedback? And I was so nervous. And he is, he is a rock star. He is like the best human being ever. Um, and he was so encouraging. And on the day that I published my site, he featured one of my posts, um, on rockstar finance. And it was like, um, for like a brand new blogger, it kind of felt like drinking from a fire hose. 
<laughs> and when you were starting out doing that, did you really have the future in mind? Or was it like, I got this little idea and we'll get it out there? Or did you go into it with this plan of, I'm going to do this first and in six months I'm going to go here? Not at all. Um, you know, originally when we became Phi, we decided just to take a year off. Uh, that was like the first we'll just focus on a year. Um, and I always encourage people to do this. Like it's so hard and it's so scary and it's so overwhelming to be like for the rest of my life, I'm committed to this, this path and not working again. Uh, like just try a year, start there, see how it goes. Um, so we had started with just a year. And one of the things that I wanted to do during that year, I wrote down on my list, something to do with writing. Um, I had always loved writing, but I grew up, I grew up like pretty close to the poverty line and just from a really kind of practical, hardworking family. Uh, and that, that internal story that I had was like, you have to have a job that pays the bills. It better pay you on Friday. Like it better pay you so, so you can buy groceries. Like to do anything else is gambling or it's indulgent or it's not practical. Like you're not being smart. Uh, if the job doesn't pay you on Friday, like you're being a sucker was kind of all of that messaging I had internalized, which is just so detrimental to an entrepreneurial or a creative life. Um, so when I became Phi, I was like, hey, things that doesn't have to make money, things like I have enough money to pay the bills on Friday. Um, let's let's kind of circle back to some of those old, old dreams. And were you nervous at all starting out to share with friends and family? Like, especially the concept of Phi is a weird one. It's not like you're talking about something that yeah. everybody knows about. It's not like you have a blog on baseball or like a blog on gardening. Like, those are things that people generally at least know something about. They know what they yeah. are. Phi is just this strange concept. I remember when I first started creating content, like, I didn't want to tell my family or especially my work or my friends because mm -hmm. they thought I was a weirdo or I thought they would think that I was a weirdo, which finds out. Funny enough, they didn't, but I didn't want to share at all. I didn't share on any of my personal social media. I didn't share anywhere where I thought that like people I knew in real life would find my stuff. So was that kind of the same with you? Were you really terrified to sharing like your, you know, the IRL, the in real life people? Yeah, I was absolutely terrified. Like I didn't post any pictures of myself. I didn't use my real name anywhere on the site. Like I was completely anonymous. Um, for like the first two years, um, because I was so nervous about, yeah, about friends and family, about those reactions. And I just knew myself that like, I knew that there were going to be bad days on the internet. I knew there was going to be days where there would be haters or I would make a mistake. Um, and I would just get blasted for it. And on those awful worst days, I also knew I wouldn't be able to handle my friends and family piling on to that and being like, see, I told you so. See, I knew that this was a bad idea. Like, you know, just kind of that extra negativity would have sunk the ship. Um, and that's what I, something I encourage everyone to do. Like, if you know that there's a failure point for you, just create a workaround. Uh, just create an alternate route. Like you don't have to power through every point of failure, especially at the beginning. It's like, speaking of gardening, it's like a little fragile plant. It's a little seedling, like give it some protection and love. Like when you move it out into the garden bed. And, you know, Cody kind of alluded to, you had those fears, but it turned out to be unfounded. What was your experience? Like you had those fears but obviously now today, that's not the case. And so how have you kind of seen that evolve? Like, were your fears like reinforced or did you realize, you know what, actually people weren't uh, piling on? Uh, online or friends and family? <laughs> like the friends and family. <laughs> uh, you can't, no one can stop yeah. the online haters. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been, um, it's been fine. Um, it, I wouldn't, it's, it's been, been fine. fine. Like it hasn't been super negative. Um, but I think a lot of my friends and family are really confused about Phi. They're really confused about what I do online. Um, and they feel uncomfortable about it. So like nobody speaks about it. It's kind of like the elephant in the room that, that we don't really talk about. Um, 
And I'm I'm pretty open now. Like any honest question people have, like I will I will provide an answer for. But I think now it's more of their discomfort um, versus mine. So let's dive into your book, Jillian. And I was really excited. I was just telling you before we hit record here. I actually just crushed the entire book on a ferry from, I think it was from Santorini to Crete in Greece. And I was feeling so motivated to go and create content after I read this book, Fire the Haters, Finding Courage to Create Online in a Critical World. We've just been kind of leading up to this. So can you tell us, like, why'd you create the book? Maybe a really high level. And I have a bunch of notes on the book, so I definitely want to yeah. dive in. But just give us a, a quick synopsis. Yeah, I... I mean, at my at my heart, I love creatives and entrepreneurs. Like these are my favorite people, um, and these were the conversations that we were having. You know, especially like I mentioned, I've been doing this about seven years, and most of my friends are kind of in that three to seven year space. Um, so we're all kind of new, <laughs> even though that's like old and online years. We're kind of like we're all figuring this out, and and all of us have to like find a way to navigate this creating online life. So I loved having these conversations. And honestly, all of the lessons in this book, it's kind of like a handbook for every hesitation, every fear, every little setback you might experience. Um, Cause I've been there. I did them all. Like I did all the wrong things. Um, I had all the wrong mindsets and slowly one by one, you kind of get through the other side. And I just thought, oh, if I could just like gather all these little things together and give it to people at the beginning of the journey, it could save them all of this heartache. And as you got the book out there, did you find that the audience ended up only being really effective for people who were wanting to write things and put things out on the internet? Or do you feel like this is a book that has a broader audience than that? Because I feel like those same kind of fears are true whether you are a blogger or not. yeah it's it's funny some of um some of the parts that really resonated with people outside of sharing stuff online um a lot of the stuff around boundaries um boundaries with your work uh boundaries with your friends and family um you know clear as kind is kind of a, an idea that's pretty universal uh and helpful across the board um so there are a lot of other tidbits in there um, and and things that just kind of get you kind of get you going and moving like you don't have to be the most experty expert like that idea, whatever project you're in um, can kind of help get people unstuck. One thing I liked that you defined in the book was inner critics. So yourself, mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, all that stuff versus like outer critics. Mm -hmm. And I mean, those are two, I guess, easy things to define in essence, but you really kind of dial down into each of those. And I was wondering if you could just speak to either of those in any way that you see fit, because I just, I found it really helpful for my own mental frame. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the external critics, um, I tackle it from a lot of different angles. Like one, you know, kind of create some characters of like, who are these people online and like how to understand and kind of deal with them. One of my favorites is the CEO of the internet. Like, that person that's just convinced that like they're your boss and everything you do and create and sh say should perfectly match their preference, their ideas, like their taste. Uh, and they'll just blast you if you step out of line. Um, and it's like, buddy, you're not writing my paycheck. <laughs> like you're not actually my boss. <laughs> it's cute that you think that though. Um, but a lot of it for creatives and entrepreneurs, um, I talk a lot about having boundaries with your work which is is not intuitive for most of us. You know, there's this huge temptation to view our work as an extension of us, as like our child that we created and we nurtured. And the reality is, if someone's attacking your child, you should defend it. Like you should go to bat and like have a big reaction. Like that's the normal framework. So what I found was more helpful for me if I have to think about my work as my child is that my child has grown. It's a full grown adult and I, they've graduated high school. They graduated college. They're out there in the world doing their thing. And so it's not really appropriate 
if my 25 year old kid is at his job for me to come in and be like, are you people being mean to my son? Who's saying what about him? Like, <laughs> I don't think you should be so critical of his performance. Like, that's a super weird helicopter parenty thing. <laughs> Um, and it's the same with my work. Um, I it graduated college. I waved goodbye. I send it out there. It's full grown. And it's supposed to do its job out there. So if it's having some conflict or criticism, I trust it can handle itself. Um, it's grown now. And actually, someone just messaged me today. Uh, sometimes people tag me on uh, social media now when they're dealing with with haters, uh, which is, I just love it. And <laughs> they message to kind of like apologize, like, sorry, I tag you in this, like, because it blows up my Twitter feed, um, my notifications. But I was like, no, I love seeing my work out there doing its job. This is what it was created to do. And it's doing its job out there. And like, I am so thankful to see it. Um, but having kind of that emotional boundary that the work isn't me and to take that a step further, I'm not my work's success or failure. You know, if, if my 25 year old gets fired from a job, I mean, that's a bummer, but like, I didn't get fired. Like I didn't lose my job. Uh, if they win, you know, an Oscar, I'm not going to like rush the stage and push them aside and grab it. Like I'm so happy for them, but like, that's not me. That's my work. Um, and when our identity is so overly tied to our work, it creates all of this insecurity uh, and fear and kind of unhealthy reactions to, yeah, the criticism, the success, the failure that you're going to have. And I think the natural reaction, like you said, like to kind of get defensive, uh, you know, if somebody attacks something that you've done that you kind of try to take it personal, I think you, or at least most people naturally almost always think, well, no, I was right. You're wrong. What about the situations where like you try to slow down a little bit and figure out if there is some kind of constructive criticism in there that you could take and, and make your work a little better? Um, yeah, I think it's important to one to like, be thoughtful of who you take feedback from. Mm -hmm. um, random trolls on the internet, like, shouldn't be your creative director. Like, random CEOs of the internet, like, shouldn't be the ones dictating your business structure. Um, and so it's, it's important to create kind of that circle of people that you've invited to the table to speak into your life, to speak into your business and to your work. Um, and and really have that a safe, like open environment. Um, and everyone else out there, like, I mean, not that it, not that they're bad suggestions, but it's just not, it, you're going to spend so much time and energy, like filtering through all of it and analyzing all of it. I'm more of the mindset of like, it's, a, if it's overwhelming, just take none of it. And like <laughs> move on with your life. Like when I first started, I'm, I'm dyslexic. So my spelling is incredibly creative and inventive. Um, and when I first started, like I couldn't hire an editor, like I didn't have Grammarly. And so it was just a little bit of a mess. And oh my gosh, the CEOs of spelling and grammar, like just blasted me constantly in like, you shouldn't be allowed to write. You're wasting our time. Um, you're ruining the English language. Like you sound like an idiot, like just we're, we're convinced to shut me down. And like, yeah, spelling is a great suggestion. Um, and when I could hire an editor, I'm very happy for them to speak into my spelling and grammar. And I, I pay them for that feedback. But at that moment in my writing journey, to internalize all of that would just mean I didn't write. Um, and I'm so thankful. Like I had an English teacher in high school who never thought spelling was essential or important to sharing stories and coming up with good ideas. That ideas and stories were something entirely different than spelling and grammar. Um, and so I was kind of like, okay, well, 
I still have ideas and I still have stories, so I'm still going to put it out there. And like some people can get their panties in a twist, but like the kind of those emotional boundaries, like that's not how people think and feel um, is their responsibility. It's not my responsibility. Uh, One of the ideas in the book is give yourself the gift of being misunderstood. Someone makes wrong assumptions. If they have bad feelings, if they think incorrect thoughts about you, just let them. Like, it's okay. (laughs) They're in charge of their own internal life. So what about when a comment actually does get under your skin? And I know some really tough skinned people, but I mean, oh my gosh, some of the comments are just so vicious, especially in those big main forums. Justin and I have gotten eviscerated. Luckily, we're both like lighthearted about it. And like, oh my, people have just said the most horrible things. But I can imagine, I mean, some content creators I'm friends with, some that I look up to, even Pat Flynn, who I admire a lot, he stopped creating content for a month because someone just kept coming at him, like really getting under his skin, saying really uncomfortable things to him. What do you do in a situation like that? Like, I'm guessing, obviously, don't engage with this person directly, <laughs> like, or maybe I'm wrong, but my, my gut tells me, ignore this person. You know, they obviously have some issues that they need to deal with. But what if it's like really bothering you and affecting you? How do you on a visceral level, like do the inner work to get over that hump. I think it's okay to take a step back, um, to log off of social media. You know, it's kind of like a thunderstorm rolling through and sometimes to engage and to stay present and to keep consuming it is just going to prolong the suffering. Uh, take a day, take two days, turn your phone off, like go for a hike, engage in your real life with your real people. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to your other creative online entrepreneurs, like people who, like I said, who you've invited to the table, who you want their feedback, you want, um, yeah, you want their criticism and their support. Uh, I, for my podcast, I interviewed uh, Tori Dunlap, uh, and she had an incident that was like a firestorm, like just days of thousands of messages and like death threats. And it was super over the top. And she just, she's like, I just disconnected. And I talked to real people who know me and like, hey, was I in the wrong? Like, could I have handled this better? Like, what why are people having such a big reaction? Like, what can I do to fix this? Um, and yeah, understanding, you know, I talk about in the book, like there's, there's the apple cart people, the people that something that you do, whether innocent or a mistake presses on an old wound of theirs. And I I liken it to kind of a deep bruise. Maybe on the outside it looks healed, but if someone knows exactly where to push with their thumb and they push hard enough, like people will cry out in pain. They'll have what seems to be this, this like too big of a reaction. Well, so that's them. Unfortunately, we're also people and we have our own triggers. We have our own deep wounds that if someone presses on really, really hard, it can, it can trigger that big reaction. Um, and I try to view that as like, okay, I have a little bit more growth to do. Okay. I've got a little bit more healing to do in this area. Like this is something that I need to kind of, I need to bring some new blood and like flood, like flush this out a little bit. Um, because obviously I still have this pain point that, the reality is like, if you create long enough, someone will find your pain point and they will intentionally push it, uh, because they want to manipulate your reaction. They want to see you having a reaction to what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I try to be as an invitation for extra growth and healing. <laughs> This question might be a little beyond the bounds of, you know, like the book, but, uh, me and Cody, obviously we don't, we don't have children. So when we have someone on the show who has a big family like yourself, I like to always ask questions about what is it that they're doing like with their children and not like I can imagine you probably have lots of lessons with them or, or exercises or just interactions where it's helping them understand because they're in a a very digital world as, as kids today where, where they're getting that. But what about like not becoming 
the internet troll like mm-hmm. understanding like what what you're what you're putting out there in the world that there's someone on the other end of that screen yeah so my kiddos are six through 14 um let's say i've got six nine ten thirteen fourteen five of them at home um none of them are allowed on any social media none of them have a cell phone none of them have any social media accounts um and one I've been on social media. I know what's out there. Um, (laughs) But the reality is like, it's like studies show it's so addictive to your brain and becoming addicted, whether it's to alcohol or cigarettes or drugs at a young age, causes your brain to develop around those addiction pathways. And people will tend to feel that addiction for their entire life. Um, and so I'm just like, there's a reason why, like, you can't drink or smoke till you're older is because if you wait till you're 21, you're a lot less likely to become an alcoholic at 40. Um, because you didn't Mm -hmm. use that as like a coping mechanism while your brain was still rapidly developing. Uh, and social media is very addictive. (laughs) Like it releases serotonin and dopamine. And I just don't want to set them up. Um, in this super digital world with a propensity for that addiction. Um, so, well, maybe my 14 year old's like, never, I'm never doing it under no circumstance. He's like, I see no upside to social media. And it's hard to argue with. <laughs> wow. Like, it's hard to be like, no, there's so many redeeming qualities. <laughs> like, I get it. Uh, I even, he's kind of into video editing. So it's like, hey, maybe you could help me out with TikTok. Like, maybe you could help me make videos. And he's like, I'll edit it, but I'm not going to make them because I'm not going to be on social media. And I'm like, well, I mean, it's kind of like my account. Like, your face isn't going to be on there. Like, you're just going to be right. He's like, no, (laughs) no, I'll edit it. But like, I'm not I'm not doing it. So, okay, that's fun. Maybe he could. Maybe he can use uh, LinkedIn. It's, uh, I feel like it's got the least amount of trolls at all. He's, he's pretty. <laughs> he's pretty adamant that uh, there's no value add. So we'll just we'll just address that when he has a change of heart. Uh, but to answer your question, like learning online behavior is really important. Um, and once they're to the age where like we need to start having those conversations. It is something that like everything else, like how do you answer the phone? How do you pick up your dishes? Like you have to talk to kids over and over and over and over, like brush your teeth. I cannot describe how many times I've had a brush your teeth conversation in my house and social media won't be any different. Well, kudos to your 14 year old. That's amazing that he has no inkling he doesn't want to be on social media at all i definitely can't say the same for myself even though social media was like on the come up i was all over myspace yeah. and facebook in the early days you did mention content creation there with tiktok though and i'm curious for those who are they want to be a content creator in some form mm-hmm. or fashion they want to you know share what share the knowledge that they have in their head with the world i remember my first i think the first podcast episode i edited it myself and i probably spent like I'm not kidding, six or seven hours because I was so nervous. I wanted it to be perfect. And I feel like, you know, even new stuff that I'm doing today, sometimes I see myself being too much of a perfectionist. So as a content creator yourself, who's been creating content for, you said, seven years at this point, how do you get over that hump? How do you get over the, okay, this is finally good enough Mm -hmm. to put out into the world. I don't need to spend these extra extraneous hours on it even though you you might want to because you think people are going to be hypercritical if there's one little thing that you might notice. But I, I'm really curious how you've kind of thought about that through your content creation journey. Yeah, so there's two ideas that were helpful for me. One, I mentioned like the myth of the expert expert. Um, it's so tempting to be like, I have to be the most experty expert to like have a voice or to put anything out there. And like, there's so many people that like are better than me or smarter than me or like more knowledgeable about this. Um, and the reality is like where you're at right now has value to someone where you're at right now can help someone. Um, and just focus on that person and just get going. Um, because there can't, like, there isn't going to be just one. Like, 
one one podcaster because they have the best podcast. So there gets to be no other podcast or one book because it's the best book and no other books get to be written. Like there's space for lots of people. Um, and the reality is there's probably some combination of your story and your personality and your viewpoint that's going to connect with someone to where I like to say, like, everybody can be somebody's favorite. As impossible as that seems, there's something about you and the way you describe something or tell this story or explain it that is going to connect with someone more than anyone else. Uh, I, I don't think I have an amazing newsletter. It's fine. I like it well enough, but like, am I like, it's the best one in America. It's the best English newsletter out there. No, it is not. (laughs) And yet every (laughs) week, every month, someone hits reply and says, yours is my favorite. Out of all the emails, I'll, if, I, if I'm on vacation, I'll go back for a couple weeks to make sure I find your email and open every single one. Um, so that's something that's helpful for me. And another more painful reality, uh, I have a chapter in the book um, about this Ira Glass quote. And the premise of the quote is that we get in to something because we have good taste. Um, we get into it because we have a good perspective, but the reality is our skill doesn't match our taste. And the only way to build your skill is to continue to produce work that doesn't meet your standard. And I, I think about it like stacking a stone wall, like, you know, where you want the wall to be at the end and every stone you stack falls short of that goal. But the only way to get up to the top is to keep stacking one at the other that falls short of what you want it to be. Um, And it's so painful. It's such a painful reality to live with. But whenever I produce something, you know, I just like, that's like my only comfort is like, the only way this is going to get better is for me to create more of this mediocre content. You know, and that kind of makes me think about, so you, you two, you do all this work, you finally get the book out there and I'm sure that's this, you know, huge event. You've been working on it for so long. Like you said, nothing can ever be perfect. So you've got to pick a line in the sand and say, okay, this is good enough. You get it out there. Now that it's, it's been out there. How do you feel? Like, do you feel like you immediately start getting feedback? Like, dang, I wish, okay, I want to make a revision or, or do you feel comfortable with where it the is? Day it released. I wanted to edit it. Um, I actually have like a file, uh, on my computer of like all of the edits. I was like, oh, I could have used this illustration. Oh, I could have told that story. Like I should have clarified these points. Um, and especially in doing interviews for the book, like, cause I'm talking about it so much and I'm getting so many questions that, uh, yeah, I'm learning to tell the stories and share the ideas better, which is like such a painful reality. But the thing that got me to like, wave goodbye to the book and celebrate its little graduation party um, was the idea that it'll be helpful. Not that it's perfect. Not that it's the best book ever written. um, Not that it's better than any other book on the topic, but I truly believed that it would be helpful for people. Um, And that's good enough. It's not perfect, but it's helpful. And as a wise woman once told me, Jillian, you make a thing, you make the rules. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain that quote? I was I was one that I highlighted while I was reading your book. So it's so tough online because it's it's a little bit like the Wild West. Like you're creating something new and different. You're not in a set structure or organization. And a lot of other people would like to make the rules for you. Um, but the reality is you have to create rules that protect your time and your energy and your focus and your vision. Um, and whenever, whenever I hear people like really frustrated with their work or burned out on a situation or just they're having all this conflict, it almost always boils down to they either haven't made rules around it or they have not clearly communicated those rules. Um, almost every time. And so it's things like around your time, um, 
around your energy, around what you say yes to and what you say no to. Um, you know, what, what do you allow people to comment? Uh, you know, what do you respond to online? You have to figure all of this out for you because no one else will. No one else will create these rules for you uh, unless they're trying to be the CEO of the internet and just like boss you around. And that's probably not helpful either. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this idea, like that's, that's my go-to saying, like you make the thing, you make the rules. Um, and oftentimes like people feel bad about it. Uh, but it's, if, if you made the thing, it's your responsibility to protect it. Like if you care about it, like create rules that keep it safe and productive. And your book talks a lot about, or it's, it's dealing a lot about, you know, how do we deal with people who may not like something you do or your fear around not them not liking something you do. But like you said earlier, you knew it was going to be, or you thought it would be helpful and that I know is true that it is helpful. And so from the interactions you're getting, like you mentioned people reply to your newsletter. I'm sure you've had people reply to you or, or reach out to you about the book. What's like the one thing that you find has been the most helpful, like the thing that people keep coming back to from the book. Like if people could take away kind of one nugget from the book. Mm -hmm. That's tough because there's, there's a lot of nuggets. <laughs> and so I think, I think <laughs> what resonates really depends where people are at. Like, what are they struggling with? Um, what's the thing that like they're stuck and that idea helped them get unstuck. Um, but in general, like I would say that your work is a grown up and you are not your work. Like that's something that we all have to get to eventually. Um, and that really helps people kind of fast track that mental mind, sh like mindset shift. Um, and I would say boundaries, uh, boundaries around your work, boundaries online, like giving yourself the gift of being misunderstood. Like what is, what is your responsibility? What is other people's responsibility? And like, I kind of compare them to garden boxes because I am obsessed with gardening. Like you have your garden box and like, that's your job. Other people have theirs, their thoughts, their feelings, their words are in theirs. Like you don't need to go over into theirs and start meddling in their garden box. If they want to fill it with weeds, let them fill it with weeds. If they want to fill it with hate and ignorance and like nonsense, that's their thing. That's their responsibility. Like it's not my job to micromanage other people's internal life. Um, it's fine if they don't like me, like, I'm not going to fight that battle. It's fine if they misunderstand me. Um, like I said, I have a role. I'll answer any honest question, but oftentimes the feedback online is like, that's stupid. I don't think that's correct. <laughs> I don't like that. That actually isn't a question that warrants a response from me. I'm like, you can think and feel whatever you want about it, buddy. Like, it's actually none of my business. Well, Julian, it is always a pleasure catching up with you and just seeing all the amazing work that you're putting out into the world. And for those who want to check out your book, Fire the Haters, keep up with you on social, your podcast, all the, all the things, where are the best places to do that? Yeah, you can buy the book anywhere. Uh, Amazon's obviously, obviously the easiest one. Um, my site is jillianjohnsrude.com. Uh, and I actually have like a free video course for content creators to kind of help, especially I, I have such a passion for like small businesses who they just kind of have their head down and they're doing their business, but like they could connect with their customers online. Uh, but they're like, ah, oh, yeah, I haven't actually done that. Uh, so I kind of geared the course for them. Like, how do you start creating content to grow your business in like really practical ways? Uh, and that's jillianjohndrew.com slash content. Well, Julian, thank you again for coming on the show for a second time with me, <laughs> third time with Cody. Um, it's been a fun time, and I can't wait to see you again in person where maybe you're running around with your snack bag. It's always my, my favorite site at FinCon. I love it. Thank you guys for having me.